Conventional Soldier, a military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Right, thanks for downloading another episode of the podcast. Tonight it's just me and Kev, and I'm down at Kev's gaff. We were meant to be going to the rugby, but thanks to the train strikes, we're here, so... Hello, Kevin, who's going to be my guest. Hello, Colin. <laughs> We've had a few questions over the podcast sent in uh, over the months about, specifically, could stay-behind OPs be used in the Ukraine? So Kevin and I thought we'd take the opportunity to discuss this. We're not experts in contemporary battle space. We've both been out of the army over 15 years, so we're very much lame and, and any mistakes are not deliberate. But if anybody has any proper expertise in this area and would like to come on the podcast, you'd be most welcome to do so. First thing we're going to talk about is artillery in Ukraine, or even the Ukraine. The Royal United Services Institute has stated that the Russian army is an artillery army with lots of tanks. And at the start of the war, Russia had twice the guns and rocket launchers of Ukraine. In November 21, Boris Johnson mocked Tobias Elwood and said that the days of big tank battles in Europe were numbered when he voiced concerns to Johnson about defence cuts. Uh, In addition, the Pentagon estimates that 80% of casualties on both sides are being caused by artillery. It is also estimated that the ammunition expenditure is 20,000 rounds a day by Russia and 4,000 to 7,000 rounds a day for the Ukrainians. So it appears that Russia is still relying on mass fires and Ukraine is using their firepower much smarter, often at range with precise targeting with weapons supplied by the West. However, mass and precision fires are both required, and it's an evident lesson that we don't have enough ammunition stocks in the West to achieve this. Examples of this precision attacks that are happening is the Ukraine has attacked headquarters of the Russian 8th Combined Arms Army, the 49th Combined Arms Army, the 22nd Army Corps, and the 76th Guards Air Assault Division, and the 247th Air Assault Regiment. So for you, Kev, any points you want to make on that? I think when we, t- we talk about the uh, Ukrainians only using 5,000, if they had enough ammunition, they would use 20,000 as well. So you think they would be using yeah, mass fires as well? so, because I think mass fires, you can demoralise an enemy as well as destroy them. You can hold ground because you can't manoeuvre into that area. If every time you manoeuvre in, you're going to get hit by artillery, so you're staying out of range of artillery. So actually, moving forward, you've got to keep your guns in range to to support but you're trying to push the enemy as far back as possible so that their guns are out of range, hence CB fire, because you try and knock out the other guns, or you you push them into that fire manoeuvre, but they want to protect their guns, because they obviously the Ukrainians haven't got as much artillery as the Russians. Do you think it's been used wisely? Because you know, you see pictures of the battle space over there, There's a, especially from the UAV shots, loads and loads of shell holes on the ground. Are the mass fires being used wisely i think they've been used traditionally yeah because that's point, that's actually. because artillery is designed as a it's it's not a position it's an area weapon isn't it's it an area weapon area denial you can destroy a loss of enemy but you need lots of artillery to do that our wars the last 20 odd years they've all been counterinsurgency using more position strike weapons but if we drift back a little bit to 1982 in the Falklands, if the British had more light guns or other guns, would have used them in the same way the Argentinians did as well? Because artillery can soften the ground before you go into an attack. They can defeat the enemy, demoralise them, destroy them, but also get their heads down in the traditional way that artillery is used. I mean, if you look at Alamein, the start of the battle was a massive artillery barrage. And let's not forget, the reason precision fires were acquired in Afghanistan and Iraq was to avoid casualties. Yes, yeah, collision. Collateral damage, damage. Whereas you're not bothered about over here. You want, want to cause as much damage as possible, well, aren't you? We're in a traditional, let's say, uh, um, a peer war. It's, it's, it's a traditional tank war, as, as you mentioned earlier. We're back now to tank and armoured formations manoeuvring around and they're fighting the, uh, a peer army. And so you're going to use way to fire. I mean, from a section, you win the firefight before you manoeuvre forward. Yeah, you suppress. Suppress. Yeah. So whether you're suppressing with a rifle, machine gun, or artillery, but if you've got loads of artillery, and, and Soviet doctrine, and now Russian doctrine, 
has always been the God of War's artillery. Yeah, and it goes back to that thing that start what I mentioned about. It's all about... And the Germans are exactly the same. Germans used artillery in the same way. And within their sections, they did as well, the MG-42 yeah. and yeah. the MG-34. Yeah, suppression, weight of fire. One thing that has changed, though, is uh, a lot of the targeting is being made possible by the use of drones, including cheap commercial off-the-shelf purchases, and also the use of Android tablets running software like Nettle. Uh, Nettle is a proprietary intelligence mapping software designed specifically for UAS, and it's a tactical system compatible with NATO SATCOMs, and it's used from divisional command all the way down to individual vehicles. And it maps battle lines, targets, and can calculate uh, artillery fire missions. Elon Musk has also provided Starlink SATCOM for nothing at the start of the war, which has been a huge asset for command and control. However, in February this year, it prevented it from controlling UAS. A lot of targeting from the West in the past has been done by the man on the ground with a set of binoculars and radios. We're seeing mass use of drones. What's your thoughts on that then, Kev? Drones are great until the weather's bad. If the Russians were starting to use smoke more to obscure, as we, we did traditionally in the Cold War, we used a lot more smoke for manoeuvre. Um, if they develop anti-drone capabilities where they're jamming, which they are starting to do, it's coming through. As, as everyone else does. We use drone against drone as well, because you can use them to attack another drone. Once you lose that eye on the ground, what, what's your redundancy? If you become reliant on any technology, any single technology, once you lose that, what's your redundancy? What's your next plan? And I think um, you have to combine it. The UAVs are brilliant until the weather's bad. UAVs are brilliant until technology counters them. And, and you know, Every battlefield, you develop your countermeasures, and it won't be long before there's really good countermeasures on both sides, which disable or uh, reduce the capability of drones. You've got to get blokes on the ground. As we, again, it's it's the traditional piece: the man on the ground, the OPs, the frontline OPs, um, armored OPs, stayed behind OPs. Screens. Yeah, it's all traditional stuff because we're back into that traditional battle. We we're talking about armored battle. And we've talked about this before where the army loves technology and they love moving things on and getting rid of the man in the loop. But, you know, you can get rid of recce elements quite quickly and you think you had recce regiments during the war. Yep. Uh, what was it called again? The I forget the... The Reconnaissance Regiment. Reconnaissance Regiment. Absolutely Re- massive. Core. Reconnaissance Corps. Absolutely massive during the war. Yep. But... um. In March this year, UK media reported that government sources stated that a standard platoon defensive position normally took 60 to 17 rounds to destroy. UAS adjusted fire has reduced this in Ukraine to around nine rounds. And UAS has also been actively used to actively target uh, individual soldiers. It's also been used to adjust tank fire beyond visual, visual range, out from 4K and above. And then Russia's also making use of unmanned aerial systems, but suffers from a shortage, a lack of commander support, and tends to be more expensive, uh, the more expensive type platforms, yeah. platforms and, and, and not so many commercial off the shelf. But we sort of touched on how they're using drones, UAS, to target individual soldiers. And just do you want to touch on what we talked about, Kev, about some of the great information operations campaign that the Ukrainians are running? but we think they're getting a bit wrong in some aspects. Yeah, I think there's always a psyop side to it. And some of the footage may work against them as well because you're not you're not showing the big picture stuff. You're getting it down to a man on the ground, which then humanizes the whole thing. And actually, is it the right messaging that you want to send out when actually you want to talk about, we stopped a tank company and this is how we did it and this is the result of... When you start humanizing it, it then starts... Um, it can work against you as well as for you. And I'm not sure if it's the right message that we need to see. There's a voyeurism to it. Yeah, perhaps. it turns into kill TV, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's, it becomes a voyeurism rather than actually what they're trying to achieve. Well, I think there's two aspects to it. There's the aspect of where it shows them hunting down and dropping grenades on individual soldiers yeah. and killing them, publicising that. And then you've got the other side of it whereby they're showing they're dropping messages from UAVs onto Russian soldiers, they pick it up and they read it and it's saying, follow the drone yeah. and we'll take your surrender. Yeah, as part of PSYOPs, that's a great story. Okay, so we've covered a little bit on artillery there, a little bit on drones. Again, it's our opinions. We're not experts. We're just 
two guys having a brew and, and talking over what was seen. But before we move on to what Stay Behind OPs and the recent incarnation as STA patrols could achieve during the war, Kev's just going to cover a brief overview of what the role was in the Cold War. Yes, yeah, so we've already done it in a, a, one of the earlier episodes about the the role of the stay behind role as it was and, and the the formation of the of the unit during the Cold War and how we had um, planning packs, so we knew roughly where we were going to deploy to, and as tensions escalated between the West and the Warsaw Pact, then special observers would then deploy into construct and deploy into hides and um, provide OPs to do uh, observation and strike on key high profile high value targets especially on the second echelon so the stay behind concept being that the first wave would go through and past us and that would be the contact battle which would be going on between the western forces and the Warsaw Pact and as the second echelon came in with more HQ artillery, rocket systems, communication systems, these would be the the uh, the key force enablers that we would try and destroy to have a bigger impact on the um the uh, on the on the Soviet uh, forces. So it's a great concept. Um it was never practiced obviously. Uh the duration was two to three weeks. The survivability was always going to be questionable because how do you then evade once you have once you've done your job, how would you evade back to uh Western lines, especially as the Western lines are gently falling back because the idea was to draw the water pack into kill areas uh, as well as wait for reinforcements from um America, the UK and other parts of NATO. How would people on foot achieve that? It was always a question mark, but we did practice the, the, the rat run back to our own lines. So the question then is, does this work in other battlefields and other wars? Well, I think there's an argument that prior to the invasion in February last year, you had an obvious enemy sitting on another side of a border, uh, plenty of time to dig in OPs and a main Mexi hide, or a Mexi type hide if you wanted. Yeah, yeah. So that argument's probably still extant that you could do that yeah there's also an argument that if special observer type operations have been forward mounted during the con- the Kerzon offensive in late 2022 for example their specialist skills in covert surveillance and targeting expertise would have made uh, Ukrainian artillery and rocket strikes more deadly and during this offensive Russia successfully relied upon two key bridges and about five ferry points to, the cr- to cross the Dnieper River and reinforce its defensive lines. So employed correctly, special observers could have monitored this area of interest and directed depth fire assets to strike prior to crossing the Dnieper River. Instead, large numbers of Russian armour moved unchallenged. But I think we talked again on podcasts. What we were doing during the Cold War had all the surveillance assets and the counter-surveillance assets had broadly unchanged since the Second World War. Yeah in the modern battle space with the whole spectrum of what they've got, do you think it would still have been a, yeah, a possibility? I do. I think um, technology is great when it works. Obviously, but you've become reliant on it and it doesn't work or there's an, a, a, a capability within one side or the other to counter it and I suspect there would be. Um, you still need to have um, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities to be able to feed the command on what's going on, on the ground to give that feed, especially to the flanks, um, to areas that you've you haven't got as much um coverage of, either with offensive forces or surveillance uh, equipment or technical, because you can't have technical everywhere. You, you you everyone's only got a limited amount. You've only got so many drones, you've only got so many people uh, reporting stuff. And so on the battlefield, obviously every unit has a reconnaissance element and that might be in the contact battle with the the recce platoon in the infantry and, and the ukrainians have the same or you have a rec- reconnaissance capability with an armored unit but you still need those people that can be tucked away in um, non-obvious areas and 
watch watch out for those key targets, not just to re- keep reporting a company of tanks, but to report the company of tanks and X, you know, um, a key piece of command equipment. Yeah, high value targets. High value targets again, because I don't think that's disappeared because the tank, the tank company going around, yeah, there's a tank company coming down the road to you. That's the contact battle. They can deal with that. But if there's a command post, which is the, the divisional command post, actually, that's the target you want to use precision weapons on. And going back to that, I gave examples of that at the yeah. start, and that really denuded the Russians of serious command and control. And, that's, and, and command and control is everything. If you knock out the command and control, the company, it, it, it's got a survivability for a period until these resupply ammunition and direction. Do you think, though, that the Ukrainians would have got away with digging in those hides, bearing in mind sort of modern satellite surveillance? I don't even I don't know if lidar can can penetrate tree I, canopies or in. I, I believe it does because um, no one's flying much air at the moment because it's a there's a air dominance already. Yeah, but I'm talking about before because we are saying that this would have been dug in beforehand. Do you think that? Yeah, but it's a it's a big battlefield. How do you search the whole battlefield mm. for a four or six man patrol in a key area? And if you do it right, as we know, it's really really difficult. How, how far can these you know penetrate the ground? There's a mass amount of civilians moving around. There's loads of civilians living in basements and such like. So things underground, heat sources or uh, picking up in in those sort of bits. It's going to be lost in the noise. And to be fair, um, putting aside the sort of the compromise by locals, I think I did about six or seven mixes back in the day, and we only ever compromised once, and that was by a forest meister. So it's all about the site selection and, and everything is. else. I mean, someone's got to come looking for you, and they've got to know where to look. If you do it well, it's all about sighting. Why would they find you? What about comms in this day and age, though? Because back in our day, it was HF comms. Do you reckon that they'd, they'd be mainly using satellite comms, but then how do you get through? Because you still need visual line of sight, don't you, for sat comms? I think for the stay behind concept to work, you need to have modern comms, but you also need a belt and brace. You need to have HF. Because when technology is getting attacked, if you're using a cell site, uh, cell mass as part of your bouncing it through, because obviously uh, mobile phones are still working out there, so the, the systems are still working. So if you're using a radio system which is bouncing off that, that can be turned off. So you'd still see a use for HF and maybe because, satellite? Because the Soviet Union and the Russians spent an enormous amount of time producing equipment that jammed you. Mm. And the Ukrainians, who are Soviet-trained from the old Warsaw Pipe days, it's still a um, capability that they'll have because they invested a lot of time and effort into jamming communications. So jamming communications, as we just say, knock out the command post, knock out the communications, knock out the, the div HQ. But also, if you knock out the comms by uh, jamming frequencies, jamming systems, why wouldn't you do it? Yeah. So you still need to have that. What happens when it all gets jammed? How do I still communicate back? Well, let's put it out there to the audience so they could drop us a line. You know, what would be the, a good comm system in this day and age is it a satellite? Is it HF? Is it a mix of both? Obviously, HF with burst transmission to, to cut Absolutely. down the transmission time. So it'll be interesting to know MD is a modern day signals guru, um, how that would, would yeah, look like. Do you want to use something that hides you? Especially if you're outside of the force bubble where you haven't got rebros or talk throughs or any of that sort of stuff, which we had in the old days to help extend the range. You're reliant on a patrol potentially 50, 60, 70 kilometers away. VHF still won't reach that sort of range. UHF and SATNAV, possibly. Well, you can bounce it off a drone if you've got a communications drone. Yeah, he's a drone, he's a relay, yeah. But they become vulnerable as well because there's obviously that's a capability that can be knocked out or affected by weather and such like. HF is still actually a good call. I'm quite sure it's been developed, but in ways that you and I don't, well, don't have any clue about. Absolutely, and it, 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 the the systems today that would be using that sort of signal will be far better. Should be noted though that secure communications back in our day 
was seen as uh, an Achilles heel of stay behind units. Now, as we've discussed again on different podcasts, 2-1 and 2-3 SAS also had a stay behind role. The operators operated slightly different from us and that a lot of the time they dug the Mexis initially in on the front line of woods, but as their tactics and techniques developed, they sort of then moved back to the way we were operating by having a hide deep in a wood and a couple of OPs deployed forward. However, there was an exercise called Badger's Lair near Saltown, Germany in 1973, and 2-3 SAS units were quickly discovered by British signal teams using DF equipment and dog patrols, and 37 out of the 39 hides were identified within hours. Now, we never were tested like that on our exercises, but I remember being, again, on huge exercises in Germany where we had companies setting up around our OPs and around our Mexis. We had armoured vehicles parked next to us, and we never got discovered. No, and I think in 1973, the capability of the the equipment would have been, when we did it, obviously our burst transmission, it was um, the original stuff was it burst in two seconds. So it didn't allow enough time to build the DF picture. And because we also had that, that discipline where you, you sent a signal on one frequency, received it on another frequency, and we had regular changes of frequencies, either a manual frequency hopping, it made it more difficult. So even in those days, so if you think about the modern radios, I know that we had a radio just before I left, which you could program all your frequencies in, and it could actually frequency hop. Mm. And it could be in a rhythm with another radio, so both of them, would be on the same sort of hot, uh, frequency when you're sending and receiving, and then just flick and flick and flick, but they were in sync. And of course, comms back to the main shelter from the OPs were by dug-in yeah. uh, field telephone line, yeah. which again minimised signature and made it more Ab- secure. Absolutely. As well. So there's, there's, there's some of the old school ideas would still work in a environment where technology, we've all got better SIGINT and... Um, intelligence services who can do this as well, who can locate and listen and all the rest of it. So you're countering, you, you're working against all that sort of standard. But in a battlefield where there's tons of stuff going on, lots and lots of signals, including mobile phones, there's a lot of information to be sifted through. So in our day, and you already mentioned this, we were rationed and equipped for basically three weeks worth of operations. Yep. And then we're expected to exfil back to our own lines. And that three-week lifespan was basically based around the fact that we were there to hold the enemy off, to allow reinforcements to deploy from the US and the UK by enough time for negotiations as well, presumably. So in the case of Ukraine, that's not necessarily the case. No, because the lines aren't as fluid. And it's a a long, non-nuclear yeah. Battle. So you might be able to stay in the location you're in because they haven't gained much ground, but you might have long range observation to control it for high value targets. But how, after that three weeks, and I'll just use three weeks because that's what we talked about before, yeah. you're obviously then going to have to take these guys out because they're a limited resource. They're going to have to refit, move out, and move back again, probably in a different role, dismounted role. Well, I think... And we'll talk about this a little bit more once we get onto the wave room papers we'll talk about. It all depends on the environment, you know, and also the... Um, if you're not falling back, it's easier. You might be at the forward end, the forward line of your own troops. Um, you might be off to a flank in a, in a bit more isolated place. But what you haven't got at the moment is this massive and quick withdrawal as NATO planned. So it stretched the Warsaw Pack uh, logistics line and we were sitting waiting for that second echelon, and then we'd have to start exfilling. And, and you know, as the battle moved away from us, we'd have to try and catch up. Um, Ukraine's gone fairly static in places. So, obviously, at the moment, the Russians are using rockets to attack the cities, but they're not moving forward as on the ground as fast as they were. They've dug in massively along um, uh, fairly static lines. So they haven't got that movement anymore. So at the beginning, they had some movements, but it's like the Donbass was already contested anyway, and those lines haven't moved that much. A few other places they did, and that's where it would have worked more, as in leaving troops behind, letting them report on what they see. And we've discussed this before. This is not a new concept. During the Second World War, there was numerous units that did a stay-behind role, whether in, in the Pacific, watching the Japanese convoys, when it was the long-range desert group watching troop movements for the Italians and the Germans in the desert uh, and other organisations like that. So there, there, if you're in the environment, 
we had a duration of three weeks because that's all we could have carry in store. But if you've got pre-positioned places and cases, you could extend that patrol. I mean, they're not limited to six people because we had six. But if you had a... We operated in fours sometimes yeah. as well. So if you said, we're going to have a stay behind platoon with a forward team, you could do relief in place. And then again, you know, when you go in the offensive, you start using them like... It's, it's a really bad term I'm going to use here because I don't quite mean it like that, but you could use them as extended range FSTs. You could do. Well, you could use them as a strike asset, but you probably... Uh, would have enough of other assets as they're moving forward to do that for you and allow you to recover them. Okay, next thing we're going to talk about is uh, there's a website called The Wavel Room, uh, and it's a really good website, produces different articles on military thought, that type of thing. And there's two articles published on it recently. Well, I say recently, one's over a year ago, but the first one was called Rise of the Rocket Launcher, the End of the Armoured Division, and that was published in February last year, just before the Russian invasion. And the second article was called Rise of the Rocket Launcher 2 Lessons from Ukraine. And the author is a serving gunner officer who argues in the first article that the rocket division should be the heart of the UK's war fighting doctrine. He also argues that STA patrols, whose ancestors were stay behind OPs, should form an integral part of targeting at 80k. Plus. And basically, he says that whilst capable of more traditional subsurface observation, they are equally capable of sub-threshold operations utilising civilian vehicles and urban ops, or sorry, urban OPs. This makes special observers the ideal sensor and fire controllers for a rocket division. What he means by operations in the sub-threshold battlefield are, it's often referred to as the grey zone, it's where states and non-state actors compete in a hostile manner using a variety of tactics but below the threshold of war. I just wonder what you think about that, Kev, because I think that's starting to ingress into other areas for me. It is. I think if you're using Ukraine, Ukraine is not a non-state actor. It is a war. And so to manoeuvre around the battlefield, you use any vehicle you can do. I mean, I think some of that... Is that not transgressing on SF a I, little I bit? Think, I, think, I think it depends on the environment, because obviously in Northern Ireland, we use civilian vehicles, and that was everyone used them. So we did use them in Northern Ireland. But it has to be a specific kind of operation that you feel you can do that and you take that risk. I think Ukraine, there's no need for that because there's enough military vehicles that are going. You can use other vehicles as a taxi, armoured vehicles, to get you near your drop-off points to your point of operation. Behind the front line, you can use civilian vehicles all day long because they do. You're going to use coaches to move troops before you start busting in moving into armour. But you've got to protect your assets as well. I think there is always going to be that danger of blurring into SF operations. I think there's a there's a specific side for stay behind or STA patrols. There's plenty of work in that sphere anyway, on the reconnaissance and uh, you know um, intelligence piece where you're feeding back and the targeting and obviously using strike assets if you can. Yeah, I, d- I think for Ukraine it's it's a conventional war using unconventional methods and in the urban environment which is always a challenge how do you move around the urban environment very very difficult because you might own one street and the operation the other opposition owns the other street so it's quite a difficult place and if you think about operations we've been on even in high intensity operations in iraq and such like when we got into the urban environment it was really really difficult so you're going to need support from other friendly forces to use as support to get you into the location, possible resupply, and most importantly, extraction. You're not going to be able to extract in a car. I mean, he also touches uh, on skills that you and I are very familiar with from tours in pre-conflict yeah. and post-conflict zones and even Northern Ireland. For example, he um, he says that special reservers could deploy forward in geographic areas of interest, building up a pattern of life, yeah. developing understanding. So if conflict comes, we are already in a position to act. And then he says uh, they should deploy early during rising tensions and small teams appropriate for each theatre. And they should operate sub-threshold and solely use civilianised platforms to maintain a more discreet posture. We already touched on that. And I do think that's problematic. And you already it hinted It can be, because I think, I think also there's a duration as well. If you start sending people out six weeks before a war starts or a conflict starts, there's a limit to how long you can operate before you need some kind of recovery as well. It depends on the intensity of the, the new operation because a lot of operations, a lot of conflicts, they're not high intensity. 
in the same way that um, Ukraine is. I think Ukraine is it's what we've trained for in the Cold War. It's mass armor, mass artillery, use of all versions of conventional weapons. If you want to destroy a city, they've destroyed the city. They will use rockets against it. It's not it's not a control. It's not an insurgency. Do you think this is an influencing thought? Because Secretary of State for Defence was on the news the other day. They are saying that there's too many infantry in the British Army and not enough artillery. And I think this is down to confusion about what the army is for. Is there an argument that we should be training for the highest level of warfare, i.e. like we were doing in the yep. Cold War, because it's easier to come down then go up. than it go up? I think so because you also it's, you you equip for the worst case scenario because if you haven't got the equipment it doesn't matter how many infantry you've got if you can't get them to the battlefield if you haven't got an armoured vehicle in a if you look at this example you, you're fighting a peer army who has mass artillery mass armour it doesn't matter about the age if you're in a soft skin vehicle even if they're in an old, old armoured vehicle they've got an advantage so you have to be able to outgun. You've got to have speed protection. It's all the normal force protection measures. So, but we 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 can't have the mass a because we can't afford it, and I, I I would argue that we can't get the people either. We're a small country. People aren't interested in joining up. No, I, I think it it takes time to build it back up again. So you've got to focus on. We're not going to fight a war on our own. The war is going to be part of NATO. So, but what can we bring to NATO that they need the most of? Well, artillery. Air defence, which is something we've paid lip service to probably over the last 20 or 30 years, because as the Cold War finished... And as drones become more prevalent? Well, we need an anti-air uh, air defence system that attacks drones, as well as fast jets and bombers. And it's because we need to protect the airspace. So we need to be smarter with air defence. We need to be smarter with the armoured vehicles, because they have to be armoured fighting vehicles, not armoured taxis, because they have to be able to fight. We need tanks, because tanks... Again, Ukraine's proven tanks are a war winner. You know, the big thing we're pushing out of here is tanks. Because again, if you're in a, unless you, even with the end laws, you can only stop so many tanks with anti-tank weapons. You sometimes have to get into a tank battle. So we're in a real muddle then because there's no replacement for warrior. Um, they're, they're talking about boxer coming in, aren't they? Yep. Ajax is in a mess. Tanks, I think they're going to have 180 Challenger 3. But it's 180 Challenger 3, but across NATO... You're going to have yeah, tens yeah. of thousands. And that's and we've got to think ourselves as, we're not a company group, we're a significant part, but we need to have, at least, you know, I suspect, we need to have a really strong brigade that's armoured. The point I've sort of danced around is, all that's expensive, all that requires people, lots of expensive equipment, whereas precision fires using special observers, what precision fires platform you're using, whether it's high Mars or something else, is relatively cheap. Yeah, but he can only he only fills one part of the spectrum of battle. But that, that can't, can't hold ground with precision weapons. No, but uh, going back again about what do we bring to the party? This goes back uh, to saying what is the British Army for? We, we we haven't got mass, so do we concentrate on the fine fixed strike piece as we, we do, call it in the old? But day? we still need some mass. Yeah, I think there's a danger that we again we go to technology rather than actually we need technology, but we also need. Lots of tubed artillery because that provides um, weight of fire and complemented by precision fire. But you don't always want to use a half a million pound missile to knock out one armoured vehicle. When actually, and there are incidences of that. You see yeah. that in Ukraine. Well, actually, it's a waste start, of ammunition. You start building smarter artillery shells, which are a bit more precision guided, but they're still a lot cheaper. And we can do mass because we don't have minefields. We don't lay mines anymore. So how do I stop someone taking over a field? Well, R2 is a great method of denying an area. Or if you want to manoeuvre an opposition somewhere else, use artillery to help shape the battlefield. If you look at those potholes, it's traditional. If you pound an area, then you're probably less likely to want to keep driving up and down that area to go and get to X. You're going to have to start thinking, I'm going to have to manoeuvre around this. I'm going to have to manoeuvre out of their range. I'm also going to have to bring up my own resources to counter battery and push them away. And if you're, you know, that, and that's part of the, the traditional artillery, the artillery raid where you drive forward and you pound an area and then withdraw. They're, they're so, I think, and those those were used in Gulf War One artillery yes. raids. Yes. And they went forward of everybody. With the, uh, was it the, um, I can't remember, was it the, what gun did they use on that? Massive gun though. Yeah, the 110. 110, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah 110. So, these things still exist. 
we just don't use them because of the last 20 odd years. We've been in a total different... Yeah, we've been concentrating on out-of-area operations, and we've been light doing, infantry. Yeah, and we've been doing precision, but actually we've got to think about mass as well. And nobody thought this type of warfare would happen again in Europe. But, but our two main adversaries, let's say, has always been Russia, and potentially we're emerging now is China, and China again has mass artillery, mass armour. North Korea, when you watch their footage, artillery is still their king as well. They still use artillery in mass. Slightly rabbit hole here, but and we won't spend too long on it because we've got to move on. But again, you know, looking back to our day in the Cold War when we saw like we were outnumbered, I don't know whatever it was, you know, ten to one, massed armored uh, divisions about to smash in, you know, three shock army. But you've seen the Russians now coming across the border, their equipments and shit state have loads of unserviceability. Are we in danger of overestimating what's going to happen in the future? I think I think there's always a. We can always overestimate their their capability in old armour. But as I say, if you've got 50 tanks and we've only got five, you've got attrition. You've got weight and numbers. Yeah, Stalin adds, said qual- that, quantity is a quality of its own, doesn't yeah, it? And that adds a value to them. So if you throw more bodies at it and more tanks, eventually you'll get through because you can only hit so many. And eventually you will start taking out our more expensive and better tanks. But they can only fight so many people. And it's, you know, it's like all logistics tales. We have to be very careful about trying to be too small, too precise. Sometimes you just need weight and numbers. But you already touched on it there. Those weight and numbers require good logistics, good supplies. Absolutely. And that's why, as part of NATO, we're in a fortunate position because if everyone only brings a brigade to the battle and they really good logistics, what you've got is 20-odd countries supplying 20-odd, very, very strong 21st century armoured brigades with all the assets that come from air defence, great artillery, position weapons, the drones, air air cover, satellites. And hopefully nations will ramp up their ammunition production Well, from think, small think, arms through to I think they've artillery rounds. Now. They, and, they and need to have war stocks as well. It's war stock more than 30 days. Yeah, okay. And interestingly, in his summary of that article then, he also touched on what you've just discussed here and saying that UAS and other I-Star assets are likely to be denied and are unreliable in modern warfare through weather conditions, etc. Uh, he also says that it's likely then, therefore, that the division is unable to conduct the fine function in the deep battle with these shortages. So other sensors such as electromagnetic, electromagnetic warfare and weapon-locating radars are also there, but they can be unreliable too. So his deduction is that, that, that finding high value and high payoff targets falls to special observer type operations due to their reliability, low signature, and skills in surveillance. In a degraded environment, technical means won't provide the solutions or the certainty that modern warfare demands. Do you think his summary is accurate there? Do you agree with I think that? So. I think technology is good. And I think weapon locating is good. Radars are good. But they're all active. They all give a signature off. They all tell you that someone's looking at you. And you can use countermeasures, so you think about um, air-to-surface missiles which attack radars because they, they lock onto the frequency, the Doppler frequency. So you can adapt that on the, on the ground, so if you want to knock it out. Drones, great bit of kit, but you are going to develop counter-drone capabilities, whether you're using air defence systems to knock them out or use the electronic systems. A man on the ground doesn't give off a signature until he has to transmit, and even that could be quite a small signature. They're not using anything. The binos don't give away anything. Yeah, passive. Are you there? When I'm driving through, am I there? Can someone locate me? Well, if you're very good, and we had to do this in the Cold War, we had to be very clever with our, our communications, and when the radio wasn't burst transmission uh, a message, it was off. So it wasn't emitting a, um, a signature. And so we have to go back to that discipline. If you're not emitting a signature, it's really hard to find you. If you've got really good camouflage and concealment, really difficult to find you. In a big battlefield, what are you trying to find a small team? Really difficult. Whereas an, an M star or a radar today emits a signal. You mentioned there about camouflage and concealment, and that's one thing that surprised me on both sides in the war, is how poor some of those basic drills are. Um, and I, you know, I remember being in uh, an OP in a very large exercise and, and thinking that we'd been compromised. So me and the guy in the OP decided we'd break out the OP and conduct a withdrawal. 
And pretty soon when we came out of it, we realised we hadn't been compromised. We just didn't have the, the experience and the faith of our camouflage and concealment yeah. just to sit and hunker yeah. down. You know, and because we were too quick to get out of there and not, you know, we didn't have that confidence that our camo concealment was so good. Because in those OPs back in the Cold War, we didn't have any positional defence systems like claymores. It was defence was your concealment because once an OP is compromised, all the enemy had to do is follow that telephone field line. Yeah, yeah. Back to the main height. That comes with a lot more experience and, and and training, and obviously a lot of the Ukrainian troops are going through some very very basic, very very quick stuff. And then pushed into a front line, and they've, they've gone very static. They've got trenches and such like. Really hard to conceal the trench when the other trench is only three, four hundred meters away. So they all know where you. And those trenches are very much like the the, first world war jobs, yeah, aren't they? Straight, yeah, not straight yeah, lanes, but zigzag, zigzaggy lanes. No but again, land. the Soviet Union practiced forever. So they've gone to in some places. They they dug in in the urban environment exactly the same. So I think for specialized troops who practice and have the confidence in their camouflage concealment, again, it adds the survivability. Putting devices out for protection, they're a double-edged weapon because actually they can give you away as well, depending on what they are. Some, you know, we, I mean, we looked at cameras in the old days, we looked at, you know, to, to observation, but you start to run it on a cable, but you don't, because you don't want to have a signal. But even a cable running a image down gives off a signal. And what we were trying to do we always was to have no, all that. no electronic signal at all. You were, you were as passive as possible, which added again to our survivability. And I think if you go down that route in the technical world, they can't find you through technical means because everyone's gone down that world and developed technical means. Probably find that they, in the Soviet Union days, they spent an enormous amount of time searching routes to look for long range reconnaissance patrols. So you remember when we went to Lerf courses and all the rest of it, the big thing they taught was if they had a route, they used to put flank protection and they used to beat the bush because they knew about Lerps, they knew about looking for it, and they used a lot more dogs. But they're not, they're not using dogs. Yeah, and also, you know, your average conscript hasn't got a clue what he's looking for. No. He's not interested. He's just concerned about getting back, but he's getting his head down so, and, and some scoff. So actually it's working for us because everyone's become technically more reliant on a box rather than actually we need to go out and beat doing the hard yards we need to get more dogs employed to hunt and find people as well they're not employing those sort of tactics so actually in some ways the survivability is a tiny bit easier because they're not looking for you in that same way because Soviet doctrine knew about stay behind because every NATO nation had stay behind capabilities Mm. So you had the SF and then you had LERPs and then you had stay behind and all the rest of it. So the forward lines of own troops, behind the line troops was was uh, was target rich if you started looking. And they knew that everyone was looking for those high profile targets. And that's why, and again, been mentioned in a podcast before that when we were doing the reckeys, you'd often go to the third best position. Yeah. Because a soldier's a soldier. If they're standing looking in, they're getting rounds on the ground, they'll know, right, that's where I'd put an OP in. Yep. So we often deployed in the least favourable position, but yep. one that give you better chances of survivability. In his second article, which he corrects a number of issues and things that have come to light since he published the first one and the Ukraine war went on, and he's saying that Ukrainian analysts have undoubtedly created targetable data based solely on open source intelligence and exploited the use of social media by Russian soldiers. And the Russian soldiers have been bloody awful at the start using social media. There was a barracks got a precision strike on it and a couple of hundred soldiers were killed because they were using social media at the time. It's also saying that civilians throughout Ukraine and partisan networks have also fed into the Ukrainian intelligence collect. And that Ukrainian civilians have been uploading points of interest to an online system which can be cross-checked with other users or intelligence inputs. And he's saying there that the whilst a useful source of information, these are not often time critical, and open source lacks the speed and fidelity of special that a special observer provides. Um, especially if they have the means of communication, the lines of communication back to target themselves at the headquarters. It's also dependent on civilians having freedom of movement. Uh, which is just saw throughout the occupation of Kherson is likely to be constrained by curfews. So social media and open source intelligence are a role to play in future targeting, but it should always be just one of a range of supports and assets available to the soldier in the loop. Would just anyone add to that? 
So the danger is not targeted, so it could be an overload of information. You need a really good organization to capture all that open source and to use it timely. Some of it's going to be out of date. It's like unreliable. Unreliable. It provides something. It might be provide battlefield damage assessments because after an event, you can film it for evidence for court cases in the future. But I think um, if you imagine how many people must be reporting stuff every day in Ukraine. You get all the loaded, couldn't you, quite quickly? How are you going to filter that and find the useful stuff amongst all of the other stuff? Um, and a lot of background noise, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think this is where, if you've got a patrol on the ground, what you're getting from them is live feed or as, as much as you can because you can do imagery as well now. But you get an accurate feed, timely, and you can interrogate it. Whereas with other stuff, you get it coming in, but you can't go back to the source and start interrogating it and ask him to do more and all the rest of it because obviously you don't know who it is. And there's a danger also that the opposition feeds stuff on that as well. So you're getting misinformation. Rub- yeah. yeah. So you're getting stuff, and and both sides will do that, and you get the false flag sort of area as well. And how, like you said earlier, how reliable is it? How do you confirm it? How do you corroborate what you're what you're seeing? Whereas the right troops on the ground feeding are going to provide you with hundred percent accuracy and something that the commander can make a decision off, not a speculative. And twenty four hour, twenty four uh, twenty four hour, twenty four seven capability it's, it's in all like, weathers. But I can ask you, I can ask you about that. I can interrogate that. I can question what you're seeing. And like I say, it helps with decision-making. We'll finish off then, really. And I obviously have concerns about numbers, sort of limited resource, just by the nature of there's a selection procedure, there's a high training burden. So you're not going to have a lot of these guys kicking about anyway. There's concerns about maybe a bleed off into special forces type operations. You need to be very careful that that doesn't happen. Uh, Any sort of, Final points that you want to add, mate, over that very broad discussion we've had. I think the bleed over is easily to it's easily coordinated because we we've, we've dealt with that on other operations and on in the Cold War. There is the lines and roles and specific jobs. If you want to do X, then that's fits with one group. Do Y, it fits in another group. You're never going to have enough resource on the ground, so you've got to be smart in how you deploy them, where you use them and how you recover them. So you're looking to fill gaps. If a recon- Yeah, they're not, they're not a blunt instrument. Oh, no. They're a precision. Precision tool, in the same way that SF is positioned, so are these. And so you've got to be smart in saying, I believe that that's the best place to put that observation team who will see the best, have the best chance to find the, the high profile, high value. It's all about that, what we used to call IPB, intelligence preparation, yeah, the, the battlefield, battlefield. didn't it? This is where you move all your chess pieces. You've got reconnaissance patrol uh, platoons. You've got recce regiments still. So if you're looking at the British Army, every battalion has got a reconnaissance platoon. Um, We've got light cavalry regiments, which do reconnaissance. So you can use them in the battlefield. They will fill all those pieces. It's when you want an enduring covert capability for specific areas, because you suspect specific targets, then you can deploy them. And redeploy smartly, but there's never enough. You never have enough tanks. You never have enough aircraft. You never have enough UAVs. And sometimes you deploy stuff into the wrong area, and they give no information at all because they're just not in the right spot. Yeah. And something else happens around the corner, and that is the commander's decision when they're looking at the battlefield. How do they shade the battlefield? How do they use the assets? Where do they use the assets? Which comes with exercises, preparation, training and experience and as the operation or the battles uh, proceed, it helps by looking at their tactics, how we deploy ours better. Well that's it really from me and Kev today, as I say we're filling in a bit of time because we didn't go to rugby and uh, go back to what I said at the start it's two guys who've been out of the army quite a long time chewing the fat over what they're seeing on the TV and reading on social media and if the MD out there can assist us in filling in our mistakes or contributing to this conversation, give us a shout and we'll get you on. So that's it for this week. And a quick thanks as normal to Nick Beale for helping us out uh, with the podcast and providing technical assistance through his company iStar. 
As usual, we're on all the social media platforms. Uh, you can find us there. Give us reviews. It helps bring people to the audience. And uh, we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier. Mm-hmm.